Hello everyone, Babenchi here. For about year and a half, my main CPU was i5-12400F, a really good budget choice for gaming and not demanding video editing. I started to encounter performance issues in After Effects especially, because most of the time After Effects use CPU power. Only these effects are accelerated by GPU. I started to think what CPU I can afford and chose i7-12700KF, 12 cores, 8 performance and 4 efficient, 20 threads in total, 4.7 GHz on P cores and 3.6 GHz on E cores, 10 nanometers Intel lithography. And why we all gather it? It's power consumption. So why that upgrade became a disaster for me? Because this. Gigabyte B760M DS3H DDR4 Good motherboard for CPU which power consumption does not exceed 100 watts. VRM has 9 phases. It's enough to keep stable power. But small heatsink doesn't make his job very well. With power hungry processors. i5-12400F in Signbench R23 consumes only about 70 watts, without limits. And the motherboard VRM held up well and didn't overheat after a long time. But i7-12700KF without limits consumes barely 200 watts. Such load heats up the VRM up to 100 degrees Celsius in 30 seconds. CPU throttle frequency to lower heat. Ok, we keep in mind that Signbench R23 Bench consumes way more power than basic apps. So let's test in CPU-Z stress test. 140 watt consumption and it takes about 1 minute and 50 seconds to reach 100 degrees. So what needs to be done to somehow correct the situation? Stupidly setting power limit to 100 watt, it's not the right way. If at rendering it doesn't make a big impact, cause power is limited and frequency is lower on some gigahertz. But working in After Effects for example, power consumption in peaks practically can reach 140 watts. These power peaks don't impact VRM temperature that much, but if power is limited at 100 watts, it can cause stutters and freezes. Better way is to set PL1 and PL2 limit according to VRM capabilities. PL1 is a long term limit. I set it to 105 watts. At that number, VRM heats up to 94 degrees. That is still a lot, but at least CPU doesn't throttle that much. PL2 is a short time limit. I set it to 150 watts for 60 seconds. And that means the CPU is gonna consume max 150 watts if load is continued for 60 seconds. Then it drops to PL1 limit. Now the CPU consumes up to 150 watts in peaks without dropping frequency and in constant load like rendering after 60 seconds CPU is limited to 105 watts. With these settings VRAM is not frying. Maybe you have a question, why I brought i7 with K index? Very simple, in Lithuania local store i7 with K is cheaper than without K. Before upgrading, I knew that my motherboard VRM cooling is not gonna be enough. But not that much. Extremely high VRM temp, let's say, is not recommended. Those temperatures may break the motherboard. For now, I'm gonna use CPU with these limits. But for the future, I'm thinking about buying a new motherboard and a new PC case uh, with a PSU because new case with good airflow can decrease VRM temperatures. With the new power supply I'm gonna feel safe, because you never know what can happen with PSU from McDonald's and Lego. More like Minecraft TNT. I'm just joking, it's silence PSU on 500 watts. It really works within its capabilities. I hope nothing happens to it until I replace it with a new one. Because long time ago I had one power supply that just exploded. Fun fact, if I run 4Mark even with undervolted GPU and CPU-Z stress test, the power supply runs into our current protection. Thanks god that games and software don't trigger it. 
I thought that telling only about my controversial upgrade would be not very informative. So at the same time I decided to make battle of classes. Meet the i3 12100F best lower end budget CPU. 4 cores, 8 threads, 4.1 gigahertz and 58 watts consumption. That CPU is gonna feel perfectly even on cheapest H chipset motherboard. i5 12400F good value mid range CPU, 6 cores, 12 threads. 4 GHz and 69 watts consumption. I used it for one and a half year. And for gaming, that's more than enough. Testing setup. 32 gigs of RAM, 3200 MHz. GPU RTX 2060, 6 GB from Gigabyte, with trash cooling system. Problem is that heatsink surface has bad contact with chip. So I undervolted it a little bit which not only decreased temperatures, but also decreased load on the PSU. All other specs on the screen. First of all, CPU-Z benchmark. Signbench R23 is more intensive. Here is interesting i7 results. With power limits, CPU was working on slightly lower frequency, 3.9, to be right. At 105 watts, my cooler Gamax AG500 keeps the processor temperature at 70 degrees. I think it's a really good result for such a tower cooler. Now time for games. CS2 1080p low settings, tested in match replay. i5 boosting its frequency even to 4.2 GHz. For Counter-Strike matters single core performance, but additional two cores make impact too cause Source 2 is more optimized for multicore than first source. i7 with its 4.7 GHz just dominating. If you're gonna cap FPS, you can get stable smooth experience. Cyberpunk 2077 1080p DLSS Ultra Performance Low settings, except CPU intensive ones. Every CPU can provide more than 70 FPS. It's clear of course that in some more CPU intensive areas i3 is gonna have FPS drops lower than 60. We can see that i3 have little stutters in gameplay. i5 and i7 doesn't have so much. PUBG 1080p 70% resolution scale, high settings. FPS difference is not that much. Every CPU can provide 120 plus FPS experience. i3 stutters a little bit, but not that much. It's not visible here, it's more visible in the scenarios where you drive around the map with a car. Need for Speed Unbound 1080p DLSS performance, low settings, except geometry detail. Interesting thing I see here. In all previous games, i7 usage was way lower than i3. Here is only 10% difference. I would understand if FPS difference would be way more. But how good is i5 and i3 for its power consumption compared to i7? Witcher 3 Next Gen 1080p DLSS Ultra Performance, mix of settings, CPU intensive Ultra Plus, all others medium. In some other tests, you can see that i5 barely can reach 80 FPS. That's because they use ray tracing. RT uses a good bit of CPU compute power. Here RT is turned off. The FPS difference by CPU is not that much. We can see good results even on i3. The first descendant, 720p DLSS Ultra Performance, low settings. That game is an Unreal Engine 5 title. We know that UE5 games are kinda CPU intensive, but not in this case. The first descendant is a multiplayer game and its code more optimized, like I see. You're gonna have GPU bottleneck faster than limited by a CPU. 
Spider-Man Remastered. 1080p DLSS Ultra Performance. High settings. I have one hypothesis why there is such a small increase in performance. Spider-Man was a PS4 exclusive title. PS4 APU has 8 cores on AMD Jaguar architecture, very similar to some FX architectures. In fact, from the point of view of processor logic, only 4 cores works as real cores, the other 4 as logical frets. So it turns out that the developers on the PC did not optimize the game that much, and the game fully works only with 4 cores and 8 frets. i7 shows a greater increase due to higher clock frequency. The last of ass. 720p FSR Ultra Performance, minimum settings, except CPU intensive ones. Another example of console port. Here situation better. Game utilizes way more cores than 4. Optimization is not ideal, actually, i3 and i5 are barely the same percentage utilized, but difference in FPS is not comparable to increase in the number of cores. With i7 I have a GPU bottleneck, but still not that much increase. Horizon Forbidden West 720p DLSS Ultra Performance Lowering the graphic settings so low, that GPU doesn't limit our CPU. At Horizon we have playable FPS on all CPUs. Beam NG Drive 1080p Ultra Settings 12 Traffic Vehicles I can brave tell you that BeamNG is showing biggest improvements over CPUs. i3 struggles a lot. i5 have better results, but still have stutters. i7 works like a charm. Even the GPU started to bottleneck. i7 consumes max 100 watts. At that number, VRM feels alright. So i5-12400 is the best budget CPU? That question you should answer for yourself. But personally for me, yes. But if I were to build a new mid-budget PC for someone else, not myself, I would better choose i5-13400F. After all, PC is a universal thing and having additional 4E cores for work tasks or background apps while gaming will not be super flows. The i3-12100F is still the best ultra-budget CPU. For some reason AMD abandoned making new Ryzen 3 CPUs. In fact, nearest i7-12700KF concurrent in work tasks are i5-13600KF. It has the same thread count but collects a little bit more scores in synthetic benchmarks. In gaming 13600KF is also better. So 12700KF is a cheap variant and a bit slower. I know that in different countries CPU prices can differ. Maybe 13600KF in your country costs less than in mine. Thanks for watching, I hope that video was informative and interesting. If you enjoy, subscribe and leave a like. And see you next time.